And then for the next portion, uh, just kind of dig a little deeper down into America Burning. America Burning is basically broken down into uh, four chapters. It talks about the fire service, the built environment, rural fire protection, and the programs for the future. So I said we would just have an open forum and anybody can talk and share their ideas about how, how EFO has impacted those areas, both past, present, and future. So in preparation, I went back to those sections and just identified, as Lou did, some of the recommendations that the commission had made. And it, for, for the first thing that was striking to me is how smart those people were. You know how the older you get, the, more, the smarter you find out your dad and mom were? Well, that, that's what happened to me going back and reading America Burning Again to see really, they really did uh, hit the nail on the head in terms of envisioning this. So the first topic, the first chapter is just about the fire service. So these are the half a dozen or so uh, recommendations they made. Uh, local government should make fire prevention at, equal, at least as important as fire suppression. This is 1973. Train and utilize women for fire service duty. Remove the laws that hamper cooperative mutual aid agreements between fire departments. Every jurisdiction prepare a fire protection master plan. Fire departments should, supply, should provide EMS and paramedical services. Establish a National Fire Academy, the cost to be subsidized by the federal government. And finally, the scientific community should give priority to fire service needs. So in terms of this, this vision of the commission and, and the fire service, you know, how do you can folks see EFO impacting the fire service, uh, both in the past, today, and kind of in the future? And it's just free for all, just open up. Anybody who wants to talk and respond, just feel free. Uh, take a minute or two to kind of address that thought. And if somebody doesn't go first, I'll call on you. I'll go first. All right. One of the things that was talked about with NIMS, think about the impact that the decision to make IC, ICS the command program here at the National Fire Academy and where it went from that decision when they, the head of the training for what was California Department of Forestry, now called CALFIRE, he came he used to talk to me about the need to have the ICSP, the command program here in the academy. And where it's come from that time, which is about 26, 27 years ago, to where it is now, with NIMS being the major management program for incident management, and ICS is the base for that whole thing. Think about the fire prevention advocates that we put through here at the academy, and then have a program at this executive level on dealing with fire prevention. Just think about all of that that's transpired in this period of time. It's amazing. Okay. Um, as you were reading that list, Doc, uh, what struck me was fine. We've got to uh, put an emphasis on fire prevention over uh, extinguishment, uh, incorporate women, um, remove some past laws, do master planning, and so on. But you can't just expect someone who doesn't have the, the intellectual dexterity and, and, and the skills, the management and leadership skills, to do any of those things. You, you know, it, it's a pipe dream. It's, it's nice to say, well, go do master planning. Well, how do you go do master planning? And, and then when you start, you, you, you take a one-week course in it. Well, who do you call if you have a question? Who's been through it before? And who's your mentor? And, and all those things. And I think the EFO did that for all of us. And did that for the fire service. It provided the um, a, a reasonable framework for us to move forward into doing each of the, the things that you read. was that I was graduating 
from the Civil Fire Officer Program. And uh, they did not select me because I was, uh, I was uh, only because I was a woman and they want to select a woman to have one in, 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 uh, in the executive branch in Puerto Rico. But it was because uh, uh, this Executive Fire uh, Officers Program uh, that, I, that I finished. There are only women in the, in the Puerto Rico Fire Department. There are about 50 women working in the Puerto Rico Fire Department, but not even one applied for the position. As I told Mr. Chabraka, he knows me for many years, I started the Puerto Rico Fire Department as an executive secretary to the fire, in the Fire Prevention Division, and then he continued going in that department in many areas in, in fire prevention, in the training division as an extent, emergency coordinator. And then uh, I was uh, designated to be the special assistant for the fire department chief and to be the press and public information officer. And at that time, I decided to join the executive fire officer program. Uh, I invite others from, from the fire department of Puerto Rico to join this program, and they, they didn't accept it. And, uh, for that reason, for that decision that I that I took is 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 the reason one of the reasons that I, that I am here too. And uh, I know about others, a uh, friend of mine that that ran away from this program, from the Safety Fire Officers Program, uh, and uh, they became fire chief in other in other areas. Some of them are, are here with us. And uh, this 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 is a great uh, program. Um, and uh, I, I really appreciate the, not appreciate, I recognize the, the, the decision of the people who wrote the American Burning Book and into, in the decision of rec to recommend a National Fire Academy for, for the nation, for, for the United States, and also uh, we have a fire academy too in, in Puerto Rico. Thank you very much. Um. Three things, or, or three questions I want to pose out to you in response to that question. Are people unwilling? Are they unable? Are they unaware? For example, you talk about NIMS, National Incident Management System. It's great that we have a system, but some of the things that's puzzling, when you go out to incidents, whether it be mutual aid or sometimes even in your own city, a lot of people don't know how to apply it. And this is the goal of the executive fire officer, is that through research in the papers and networking, we need to make sure that people are aware of how to implement NIMS. If they're unable, we need to find out why and train them. And if they're unwilling, we need to try to change their mind so they can have another point of view. It's very ironic when we talk about fire prevention as our first line of defense, but yet in this economy, what's one of the first things they want to cut? Fire prevention. So again, as an EFO uh, student, I honestly believe that all of us have an opportunity to make sure that we look at those three things, unaware, unable, and unwilling, and try to change that through what we're doing with this program. Lou, if I go back to you and the America Burning Commission, because one of the brilliant things I saw in there was about not only establishing the fire academy, but then also putting the burden of the cost on the federal government as opposed to the local jurisdiction. How, how did the commission know that that was going to be the one, the, the key to the success of the fire academy? Well, the locals couldn't handle it anyway. They didn't, they didn't have the money, and, and if the feds didn't pick it up, it just wasn't going to happen. And plus, local people. How do you convince them you ought to do the thing that needs to be done? And they have to try to squeeze out of, out of I don't need that damn thing. Squeeze <laughs> it out of the budget of money they don't have. So uh, this whole premise uh, was based on federal government picking up the tab for it. Now, did, 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 the, did the commission really believe that the federal government would come through and actually do that from your recommendation, or was that a Hail Mary? Oh, no, no. One, we, we had some good people, how we McClendon, Perth Bugby, uh, Baron Whitaker from uh, Underwriters Lab, people that had connections with Washington. We believed we could get it. We didn't get as much as we wanted. If you look at the mayor burning, burning we recommended 
$150 million the first year, and we ended up getting, I think it was like 50, and then it went down from there in many years. So just, just to make sure that we all understand that you all did your homework, you, you kind of knew ahead of time that Congress was going to accept these recommendations and put it into the law that the feds would help cover the expense of fire gap. Yeah, Dave Gratz, and many of you know Dave Gratz, Dave Gratz always said, you have to have a godfather in Congress. And our godfather was Senator Warren Matheson from the state of Washington. And that's why we believe we can do it. Super, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next major uh, chapter in America Burnings, the built environment. And some of the recommendations were that more research had to be done on the whole area of emission and combustion and testing. They also recommended that the newly created Consumer Product Safety Commission should give priority to combustible hazards. They recommended that applying science and research to building design and codes was going to be important. In 1973, they recommended that smoke alarms and sprinkler systems be installed in residential occupancies. Finally, they recommended that the National, Board of Safety, National Transportation Safety Board improve hazardous materials transport across the country. So, Fire, fire is a people problem. Fire is a building, a, a built environment problem. So, you know, what has the impact of EFO been on our built environment, our built environment when it comes to fire protection? Uh, Kurt, can I start with you since you were with an FBA? So, uh, th that was kind of your job up there. Well, I, I can I can give you my response to how EFO has has impacted, and I think it's. It's uh, increased the professionalism of the fire service. Uh, and in, some, in many ways, I mean, I, I know the IEFC was, uh, was a sound voice, a solid voice, uh, prior to the, the uh, EFO program, but certainly afterwards. Uh, and you know, you look at the people that are leading the IEFC, and, and most of them are EFO grads, and, you know, so. But I, I think overall it's increased and enhanced the professionalism of the fire service so that when we're dealing with uh, the built community, whether when I say the built community, I mean uh, engineers um, or uh, legislators who are looking at adopting codes uh, and also getting involved in the code process, um, that we're, we're looked at in a, in a different way uh, and we're able to interact in a different way than we would have been without the EFO program. I wanted to read another uh, the comments about, uh, about that information. Uh, the American Burning Report was, was reading to address the nation's uh, fire problem because there was indifference in the way that the Americans were confronting the situation, as he said. Uh, the this, this, this statistics presented in 1973 compared with the statistics presented in 1989 uh, after the review that we had in the book, the American Burning Book, uh, shows that we have uh, at least 50% uh, less fire fatalities in the nation. The property losses are higher and the cost of treating severely burned individuals is higher too. This data came from the U.S. Fire Administration in September 1989. I do not have on hand the, the recent data, but talking about the, the new the technology and the smoke detectors, the reduction of fires and fire fatalities is the result of the fire prevention initiatives and the studies about fire risks, smoke detectors, home, for, home fire protection, the, the study and evaluation of the fire codes, and children's fire protection, and thousands of programs delivered by the U.S. Fire Administration and the states. New techniques in firefighting, more equipment, and the most important part, the commitment of the fire departments to respond fast and efficiently to all kinds of emergencies is helping in reducing the number of fires, fatalities, and injuries. The EFO prepared me and the other uh, students, uh, the other officers of the SFD Fire Officer Program in identifying risk, risk in our communities. Also, I, I would like to tell you that after I uh, uh, attend the, the Safety Fire Officers Program, um, we in Puerto Rico uh, prepare the first smoke detectors uh, programs in the island, and we uh, visit uh, visit the families that were living in in, in high-risk communities 
the, the families that, were, that, that are actually living in, in the mountains. And you know, when, when, when there is a fire, there, sometimes the, when, the, when the fire truck arrives in that community, it, it, it is too late. Or back for them, uh, we, identified, we identified that they were in, in high risk, and we installed some of the detectors in, in thousands of, of homes there in Puerto Rico. I think we evaluate that, that, that risk. Uh, there is a mis misconception that if there are fewer fires, we don't need more firefighters. But the community must think about it. And we must think about why the community think this way too. We must inform the community about our job that is not only related, that, that our job is not only related to fires, but also with all kinds of emergencies, fire prevention, fire protection, and at, and at other thousands maybe of situations that where we are involved and that we are helping, we, the, the, the fire departments are the helping hand for the community. If we disappear, like many people want us, in some areas want us to disappear or reduce the, the amount of firefighters, if we disappear, the fire problem is going to return. It's going to return. We cannot reduce the education, the educational programs and our presence in the community because again, if we do that, the fire problem is going to return. Thank you. Yes, look, go ahead. Uh, a comment, if I may, while we're doing the study, one of the things we recommended that as, as was talked there a moment ago was that every home should have a smoke detector in it. If you look on page 148 of America Burning, at that time, Step Crawl was the only one that made them out of Colorado in there. But he ate big, it weighed about five pounds. But what we learned from Commissioner Dorothy Duke, who was there re actually representing HUD, she said, and those units cost 120 bucks at that time, that if you put one into each home, and with a home in those days being somewhere around 25,000, the cost of that detector to that mortgagee at the end of that morning would be $1,000. So it was something that should have been done, but couldn't afford to be done. Of course, today, 50 bucks would buy you and fill a house for them, but it took 40 years to get there. But, but the vision was certainly there. Yes. The, the vision was certainly there, so that's, that's amazing. Okay. Anyway, question I'd ask, how many communities in this country don't have mandatory smoke detector legislation? Very they didn't hear you. They didn't hear you. How many communities in this country don't have mandatory smoke detector? <coughs> Not many. <coughs> Anybody else want to take a crack at the phone, Mark? We're right for another. Yeah, I just. Uh, uh, I'd like to share a quick story with you, if I may, and, and it has to do with the smoke detectors. Uh, a lady called uh, one time, called a great son and basically asked him, she said, you know, my smoke detector keeps beeping. I don't know what's wrong with it. So the grandson went over, said, it's very easy, Grandma. I learned this in school. You need to change your smoke detectors. And he sat there and explained to her, you know, fall ahead, spring back, no big deal. Finally, about three months, me, her grandson, was out at FDIC, and a fire occurred. That smoke detector that was beaten ended up saving her life and my two cousins who jumped out of the window. This is what the EFOP is all about. And we talk about educating not only the people, the legislatures and everybody else, but we need to educate the public. Because there's still a lot of people out there that don't know when to change the battery in their smoke detector. There's still a lot of people out there that still feel that they can crawl on their bed when the fire comes. And this is where I think the EFO needs to really focus their efforts, is looking at the behavior. Why do people think this? And, and through the education, we also need to look at that, train our children when they go to school, stop dropping roll. These programs are important. And we also need to justify to our administrations, our mayors, our lawyers who want to cut our budget, that this is our first line of defense. And it's definitely made differences. 
Uh, the next area in American burning is referred to as a rural fire protection. I think today it would be the urban wildland interface. And again, the, the recommendations were, were pretty insightful. Again, smoke alarms, master planning. It said the U.S. Fire Administration and the U.S. Department of Agriculture should you do joint exploration about fire safety education. They recommended the development of uh, a National Fire Weather Service part, as part of NOAA. Uh, they said that, uh, and, and Marion would be happy about this, they said that federal funding should be connected to requiring fire safety education in school systems. They said uh, the federal government should help fund fire safety education programs.